Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit demo meeting for April 17th. Thank you. Um, all right, so uh, it's a bit of a small group here today, um, but uh, we do have still a few announcements. Uh, I will mention Google Summer of Code has come to a close in terms of applications, but we are now in the decision phase. So this is a delicate dance between us and Google where we say we really love these people and Google says, mm, okay. So we're waiting for that second half. Uh, but with any luck, we will have decisions announced uh, next week. Uh, and so even though we had uh, dozens of applications, uh, we will only get to select a few of them, but we're, we're hoping for the best. So let's see, we'll, we'll, we'll let you know as soon as we possibly can. Um, another continued announcement, uh, much to the chagrin of Jeffrey, who's been, uh, and, and everyone else who's been pouring through resumes. Uh, we are still hiring, uh, specifically uh, what, what I myself am most eager to see is a junior security researcher. Yes. Um, I believe engineer one is the proper title, but uh, basically uh, someone to join the Metasploit okay. team. And uh, not, we're not looking for a senior person. We're not looking for a lot of experience. We're looking for passion. Yeah, we're looking for somebody who does personal projects. I don't know if, if you can talk about a little bit way about um, what you're looking so for. So for the security researcher position, uh, like like he said, is a junior one. I mean junior. Um, I'm looking for. We're looking for somebody who uh, who has some programming background. Uh, somebody who loves you know uh, security. Uh, hopefully, some experience in you know security, such as like pen testing, that sort of thing, um, and definitely, you know, someone who uh, who's hardworking. That would be nice, you know. <laughs> that, yeah. Yeah. Oh, passion. Yeah. And passion. Yeah. That's that's okay. So anyway, uh, rabbitsim.com slash careers. Uh, I don't know if there's. I mean, we've got Slack. Uh, if you want to jump in and kind of. Get a, get a little feel for the project a little bit more, or you can reach out. Uh, Way I know you're on Twitter. Yes, I'm on Twitter. What's I'm it? also on LinkedIn. So you, if you apply, you might see me on LinkedIn looking at your profile. Yeah, stalking you. <laughs> stalking. You might see the white van drive by your house. But yeah. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Yeah, it's, fine. it's fine. Just checking your Wi-Fi security. It's friendly. It's a yeah. friendly van. Yeah. Hey, get. <laughs> Moving on. Yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, something new this week, or more specifically, just last week, uh, we. Uh, when I say we, several of us from Episode 7 attended InfoSec Southwest, which is a local conference. Um, and so, because it's local and uh, InfoSec focused, obviously you can uh, expect a lot of folks from Episode 7 were either attending or uh, helping. Uh, Todd Beardsley was uh, a con organizer and also uh, took over the scavenger hunt this year, which was a hell of a lot of fun. Just, just a, a blast around Austin. Uh, but a lot of the, the back behind the scenes stuff in the con. Uh, our our, uh, our beloved uh, Brett Cook, who's uh, taking some well-deserved vacation time at the moment, uh, presented a tool called Metalsploit, uh, and I'm not going to steal too much of his thunder, except to say that uh, you can now run Metal and get a somewhat of a Metasploit environment, and I'm happy to let him talk about the details of that. Uh, I don't, as I said, I don't want to steal, steal his, uh, his thunder, and unfortunately, uh, the talks weren't recorded, so uh, there's no way to go back and see what he did, but uh, I'm sure he'll want to share his slides and, and talk about it during our, our next demo meeting. So I'll leave that teaser out there. Uh, I myself uh, worked on a, a CTF environment called OpenSock, which is uh, this, the idea is to give uh, con attendees, especially in these smaller conferences where you're not dealing with people who are senior, uh, give con attendees an opportunity to play with uh, these uh, open source defensive tools, so things like Moloch, things uh, like uh, uh, Graylog, basically all these tools that are going in and collecting all your event logs from all the hosts on an enterprise network and watching your network traffic and giving you uh, the ability to, to analyze packet captures and get at raw data. Uh, so not only to play with those, but to play with them in a pretty damn realistic corporate environment, so where you get to see uh, you know, a whole bunch of Windows and Linux systems and servers and, uh, you know, all these different firewalls and devices talking to each other, uh, web client, they're like, uh, uh, you know, employee machines that are generating lots of web traffic, um, you know, to just out to the internet to watch Facebook and YouTube and whatever else that employees want to do. Uh, and so in, in the middle of all of that, of course, are a number of attacks, uh, including some uh, that are Metasploit based. And so then the participants have to go through and answer a bunch of questions. 
so anyway, this was kind of our, our debut of OpenSock, uh, but we're going to be doing that uh, a little bit more so. We got accepted to Layer One, which is a conference out in California, um, and potentially, uh, at the risk of, of, of jumping the gun, we're, we're hoping to bring it to DEF CON. Um, so anyway, we'll hopefully be seeing a lot more of that. Anyway, so good con time. Uh, that said, between uh, some of the conferences and, and folks being out, uh, there, there wasn't a lot of activity this week, but I'll talk about what we do have and also some things to watch coming up uh, since we do have a lot in the pipe. Uh, so right now, uh, as far as payload, payload functionality, uh, Brent landed uh, some support for Solaris 7 with the, our metal payload. Uh, he, he, I, didn't, I didn't talk to him about it, I don't know what he meant, but in one of his comments he's like, yeah, I need this for supporting other platforms, and he didn't expand on what that might be. So uh, we'll just leave that open and hanging there. Uh, but I know that was requested by the community, so, uh, so that's helpful. Uh, the Python interpreter now has support for UDP channels, so that's kind of more in line with some of the things that uh, uh, you know, the interpreter payload supports. Uh, and then we got a couple new modules, well, uh, several new modules, but uh, primarily, uh, right now it's under uh, the, the uh, aux gather uh, browser private get IP. Uh, but this is a, a tool that leaks uh, using WebRTC, uh, the local IP address, that's the IP address assigned to the computer. So if you're behind NAT, you can see the local IP address of, uh, of a given uh, workstation. Uh, also, uh, Etsy, or ET, I guess it's etcd, I don't actually know how to say this, but it's, uh, uh, this is a tool that uh, you find in a lot of big data centers where they're uh, basically using it to store configuration information, like key value pair information for a server, so maybe you have a bunch of these images that spin up, um, and you know, they need to start pulling back configuration information to see, okay, what's my host name, because they're all based off the same image, and what's my configuration, what, what, is, what is my purpose? Um, and so uh, this was a, a tool that basically will scan for those and, and pull back data uh, from these uh, key value stores. Um, a lot of our changes over the last two weeks have been making Metasploit just a little bit easier to use. Uh, and so some of these are things we found internally. Uh, some of these were things that, uh, uh, my favorite was there were, uh, two, I think, two of these issues that were ones, uh, yeah, I see them on the list here, that, that I created. Uh, just an issue for and tagged it as newbie friendly and like within 24 hours someone from the community had jumped in and made a, made a fix for it. So that's kind of fun. Um, so uh, things like search-h wasn't always working. Uh, if, if you didn't give search any arguments it wouldn't necessarily bring, bring up help. Um, there was a, an issue with route where uh, if you did like route get and then you gave it you know, a string, it would treat it as a host name, uh, but then if that host name wasn't resolvable, you'd get this big trace back that you know, looked ugly, as opposed to just, hey, that's not resolvable. Um, so things like that were easy to fix. Uh, there was another one which I'll call out, which is a few more down, which is this, uh, the run as module, which uh, when you did run as, there was a flag to say, hey, write out the files so that I can see the output of this command. I can pull it back. Um, but then it wouldn't clean up that file uh, when the uh, module finished running. And what was kind of worse for me was that even if you turned that flag off, it would still create the file and just leave a zero byte file in the temp folder um, and just let it sit there. Um, so, uh, little things like that. Um, we had a community contribution for reverse HTTPS module. Um, Oh, I'm blinking on the name, Matt. Uh, hmm. Nope, it's gone. Dang it. Anyway, uh, we have a community contribution for reverse HTTPS where now uh, you can just listen on zero to zero to zero, so like a global uh, interface, and then that way, uh, no matter how many interfaces you've got or virtual IP addresses or whatever, um, you can capture back uh, any any callbacks, and so that's kind of handy to have. Um, there was an issue, the third bullet from the bottom, which was uh, non uh, in, in some file systems, uh, you would have files being marked as executable always, regardless of whether they really were or not. And so Metasploit was having problems with that because it was trying to interpret a bunch of files that weren't Ruby files and import them in as modules. Um, and so that was an issue that we are now checking just the, the first line of the file and make sure it really is a Ruby file before we, uh, before we act on our, our Oracle stone file. Um, actually, uh, the issue that was going on there was uh, 
we were loading classic Ruby modules on file systems like uh, FAT32 or some uh, network file system configurations where all the classic files were marked as executable, mm -hmm. uh, which would cause us to try and load every single one of the 3,000 files or the 3,000 module files we have about uh, and fail, uh, which is a pretty slow path to do in a single thread. And it would cause a framework to take uh, many minutes to start up. I think somebody said like 10 minutes. Yeah, it was ridiculous. At least it's like a, a screensaver came on multiple times. It's like, all right, yeah, that's, that's not great. So anyway, yeah, it's a good fix. Um, okay, so a lot of little things like that. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else on this list that I'm skipping over that anybody wants to talk about, but a lot of little things. So uh, that said, there are a number of PRs in the in the queue uh, to watch for the, the next couple weeks here. Uh, there's a RCE in this Mantis bug tracker uh, that uh, so we've got uh, submitted that we need to get tested and landed. Um, I want to say, uh, who's working on the Drupal stuff? Will. Was that Will? Okay. Um, so yeah, there's uh, real code execution. Well, supposedly in like many versions of Drupal 7 and also many versions of Drupal 8, but he made a comment in the, in the PR about possibly Drupal 6.2. Uh, I, I should clarify, Drupal 6 as well. 6.2.8, 6 <laughs> according to some writer. Okay, wow, all right. Um, so that was a little different than what I was you know, reading in the CVE, but that would be kind of cool. So that's, uh, that's in, the, in the pipe as well. Um, there was an OS Commerce uh, exploit, which I couldn't find a CVE for, um, but there was definitely a lot of discussion about it. Uh, and so that's got a remote code execution bug uh, and a very specific version of OS Commerce that, uh, that would be publicly uh, accessible in a lot of places. Um, and then there was a CVE from 2017, in the, uh, specifically in the Ubuntu kernels, um, that was a privilege escalation. Uh, and so we've got uh, that PR that's coming down the pipe as well. So hopefully some good demos for next time. Uh, a couple of AUX modules. Uh, there is a Coldstone module for uh, including the Impacket DCOM exec, uh, which is a thing that uh, it's basically like PS exec, but using DCOM methods. Uh, and so this is a tool that's called Impacket that does this. It's a Python based tool. And so that's uh, hopefully integrating nicely with Coldstone. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure how close that is. Adam, I don't know if you've been following that one at all, the Impacket DCOM exec one. Yeah, it's pretty much ready. It just needs a fair bit of testing to make sure the conversion worked well. Sweet. Okay. Excellent. That's going to be fun. Uh, and then a, uh, a simple RCE and uh, PHP my admin um, that uh, will give you, you know, code execution on, on uh, a lot of those uh, UIs that are publicly accessible as well, but that's a few years old. So we've got that in the PRQ. Uh, one post module, which is this, this one I kind of liked. It was uh, a pen tester who was trying to figure out uh, the location of a machine. And so they wrote a module uh, that sends an 802.11 probe request out Wi-Fi. So you got to interpret on a box, and you want to try and figure out where it is, like located on, on the property or, or some, some physical space. And so you can use this module to send out probe requests and then just, you know, on your, on your pen testing laptop, sniff, and based off signal strength, triangulate where this, this machine is at. Like, that's kind of cool. Uh, cool PR. So I'm, I'm eager to see that one landed. Uh, and then uh, Wei was working on our, uh, MSFN support for encrypted payloads. I don't know if you wanted to, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. So this is, so in the past we've seen that people use MSF, the encoders, to as a way to, to bypass antivirus. And I would keep telling people encoders aren't, that's not why we invented or created these in the first place. Um, what they really need is some kind of encryption um, to to protect their to, to protect their shell code in order to prevent being you know flagged by antivirus. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is why we have this PR. So right now, this PR all, all it does is adding support in MSF Venom to be able to encrypt your shell code as long as you're using a transform format. You can add encryption on top of it, and then the the output will be will be the encrypted you know the output, um, and then you can you can copy that into your code probably C or whatever. You can write your decryptor and then your loader, 
that way you can increase your chance to bypass uh, antivirus. Um, obviously, the decrypting part is kind of challenging because you will have to know how to do that on your own. But we're gonna improve that later. So hopefully, in the near future, we'll be adding these decrypting uh, routines for you, probably in Metasm or somewhere. That way, you can build these things uh, much more quickly. Cool. Yeah. And it looked like most of the, the heavy work for that was done. I know there was some stuff with namespace and a couple. Yeah, this, yeah that should be done. That so. should be sorted out very easily. And then, yeah. Awesome. So I look forward to that one. All right. So from there, uh, if you want to pivot and kind of talk a little bit more about the individual team's uh, script case. Uh, yeah. So in the last couple of weeks, we had a, a, a few different things to, that we've been processing through. Um, we had a, help, a little bit of a helping hand with an exploitable three issues backlog. Um, we had some issues where uh, Chocolatey um, broke their latest build. Um, and I haven't seen a release of the newer version yet, so we had to go in and lock that version. Um, and then 7-zip uh, actually updated to a newer version and transitioned the, uh, the what we thought was a, a fairly static URL um, for downloading its application um, to something behind the source for redirect. So we had to go back, go back and uh, update that environment to get that working properly. Um, but it looks like uh, the Windows builds are actually working again. Uh, at this point, we're still working on adding a little bit more help there to get that uh, transition to be a vagrant box um, that can be downloaded easily um, as opposed to forcing everyone to build it themselves all the time. Um, so we're, we're, we're working on getting a weekly build out for that, but we haven't quite gotten that completed yet. Um, uh, we also landed uh, some new additions to the VM Automation Library uh, for Python um, that uh, brought in uh, some of Aaron's updates there to be able to support cloning on, uh, on ESXi box directly. Um, uh, this gives you a little bit more of a, 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 a quick configuration cloning functionality. Um, there are some ways to do this uh, with OBF tool and exports and imports. Um, and OBAs, but once you've once you've built all of your uh, all the environments based on things like what we're using with Metasploit Baseline Builder, where you don't necessarily have an OBA that came out, um, this could make things a little bit faster to get clones set up and configured. Um, uh, hopefully, we'd like to integrate this into some of our payload testing environments, so that we might be able to actually do clones of a lab that's necessary for running a test uh, just prior to running the test, as opposed to having to go. And uh, go and actually have 10 or 15 clones available in terms of storage space um, when you actually go to run your tests because the, there are some uh, some system requirements associated with every VM you spin up and need to keep up at the same time. Um, uh, we also added some new work uh, into our services functionality. Um, we're working on uh, getting some AV Lab environment setups uh, put into the services functionality that is actually a sample, a set of sample code in the VM automation code base um, to be able to do things like bring up the vendor, update it, get it in place, um, uh, we're starting to look at other uh, other um, applications uh, for AV such as Avast and Semantic um, to try and get environments set up where we can have some more baseline environments to work with in our testing. Um, and then we supported the commercial release, um, which included a couple of uh, new functionalities or, or corrections to functionalities in Pro. Um, we improved the API edition. That was another thing we uh, put some work in, mm -hmm. into, and uh, we got some improvements in that uh, landed in the Pro functionality, as well as uh, we removed the um, OpenSSL v3 um, uh, protocols that were available when starting a social engineering campaign. Um, this just improves on, on, on the security posture of the actual target to, to, to improve on, on, on how many people might actually fall for it. But, but now we no longer support Netscape Navigator 2.0. There you go. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> give and take. <laughs> Some trade apps. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Dharma. Dharma Initiative. Uh, Way or Adam? Oh, gee. I'm sorry. So. So we talked about the encrypting uh, shellcode, you know. Mm -hmm. By the way, this is this is good for static sta uh, static scanning, uh, but obviously when you have antiviruses, like a bunch of different things, static scanning, this behavioral runtime on probably machine learning and all that. This
this part is good for static, okay? But if in the antivirus has the runtime, you know, uh, protection turn on, then when this thing, you when your malware is being executed, it should be able to tell still. Um, there are other ways around that, but this is out of the scope. Uh, for Ruby SMB2, um, Dev, would you like to share? So, uh, uh, with in Ruby SMB, uh, Jacob has been adding some extensive error handling around dealing with uh, pending statuses when trying to read and write to named pipes. Um, what we were seeing was when uh, trying to uh, run the psexec module, for example, um, every so often on SMB2, you'll get it, it, the module will fail due to just mishandling of this pending state um, on a pipe. And um, he is covering all these uh, edge cases to get 100% reliability. Sure. Yeah, but it's really close to finishing. Uh, other than that, we also have this padding oracle module on the way that a while ago we did a workshop and then um, uh, Jordan is trying to build a module for ASP.NET. Yeah. Um, it it's one of the challenges was finding a vulnerable, <laughs> vulnerable machine. Yeah, I've been helping him with that a little yeah. bit. Uh, so Jordan Lewis from our uh, pen testing group. But like, yeah, he still sees like vulnerable uh, machines doing a pen test. Like inside so, a customer network or yeah, something. I mean, so it's not like. So yeah. this is oh, still like somewhat that. valuable, even though this thing is really old. Yeah. Um, uh, obviously, the the Drupal uh, exploit is this. Uh, as far as I know, this is a uh, call injection in the form API for Drupal, and I think it's there by default. So interesting. And uh, also, we have the WebRTC module that allows the attacker, or it's being set up as a you know a, a, a browser module that you can trick people into. Visiting and then using web RP RTC, uh, you can actually leak the private IP address and add them with mm -hmm. that in a little bit. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so normal form. All right, um, a lot of our work for the last sprint has been fixing bugs that we introduced with the Goliath merge. Um, obviously, that was a lot of big code change, uh, so a little bit of fallout was expected. Um, uh, Matthew fixed a bug um, related to how the um, database was loaded. Uh, we expect the, the Goliath changes expected there to be a data, database.yaml uh, file present, and if there wasn't, uh, some bad things happened. So that was a use case that we broke, um, and, and it's, it's now fixed. Uh, he, he fixed the loading around that. Um, and what else? There was also some issues with services search that I broke when I uh, did some changes to uh, how services are looked up. You couldn't, it broke the dash P flag, so you couldn't actually search by service, uh, by port number anymore. Um, that, that's working again. Um, we also got up PRs for notes and workspaces, moving those to uh, the remote data store and supporting CRUD operations on those uh, via the API. Um, notes just landed yesterday. Workspaces is still in progress. That one's going to be, that one's a, a big change. Um, there are 46 files changed. It's like 500 lines of code or something like that. So uh, it's going to need a lot of testing. Um, and I can almost assure you that stuff will break when it lands, but please let us know so we can be fix gentle. it. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I, we'll see how it goes. I, hopefully it's not too bad. Um, we, so uh, we've only got one more uh, like major data model to convert to use with the API uh, after these two land, and um, that's creds, which that one's going to be kind of an undertaking because there's a lot of associated models with that. But um, because we're getting to the end and, and externalizing all the, the major data models and commands, we um, are starting discussions around how we're going to change the data model um, and how, what those are going to look like, what we need to add, what we need to remove, um, what we need to combine. Uh, so we started talking about that last week. One of the things that we got out of it is we really want to know what people want out of it. Um, we all have our own ideas, but mm -hmm. it'd be nice to know um, what, what the community is looking forward to. So uh, we're going to be putting out a survey. I, I don't know an exact date yet, but we, we're getting it together and we should have it out and we'll 
broadcast that through multiple channels. So please take that survey if you're interested in module development or just using Metasploit or you know development on the Metasploit framework itself. Uh, any feedback would be very much appreciated. So keep an eye out for that over the next few weeks. Yeah, survey. Okay, yep. cool. And uh, Deb, I mean, uh, GitHub has this wonderful feature where you can like, dislike, laugh, and love um, pull requests and issues. Uh, so everything uh, is better with emoticons. Everything, yeah. They're called Reacts. Reacts. Uh, here. Excuse, I apologize. I'm <laughs> clearly too old. So uh, <laughs> I'm, not hip, in, I'm not hip enough to know. <laughs> in, in a hackathon, uh, Pierce uh, he wrote a Python script to uh, aggregate the React counts on these PRs issues across um, several repos. So we are going to add a section to benesploit.com to, um, to show the most reacted to uh, issues and peers. Nice. That should be fun. <laughs> What's the name yeah. of that project? <laughs> the name, the name, of, <laughs> the name of the, his, Pierce's script was called Kitty Cat Count Count. Okay. <laughs> I, he told me the story of what that was based <laughs> off of, I don't remember. Anyway, okay, yeah. <laughs> All hail Pierce. <laughs> yes, one of the one of the many legacies he's left behind. All right, so that brings us to demos, and uh, unless anybody has any last minute additions, I know Adam has one. That's all I have so far. So. Uh, all right. Yeah, Adam, please uh, share your screen. Take it away. I think you have to stop sharing for instruction. I will be demoing the uh, WebRTC uh, LAN IP leak, uh, and so. Uh, WebRTC is a uh, direct peer-to-peer -peer, uh, video conferencing uh, protocol. It's used uh, most prominently by Google Hangouts. Um, I'm not sure if Zoom is using it. I think Zoom is using some other peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, uh, maybe something more directly related to Stun or something. Um, but most modern browsers now uh, support uh, WebRTC by default, unless you turn it off. I actually have it turned off in all of my daily drivers because of which you are about to see. Um, this module itself is pretty simple. Uh, it just has the host and a port and it spins up a web server, it drops off a little bit of JavaScript, and then it works its magic. So we see it starts on uh, all the interfaces it can by default, uh, but we're gonna to connect to it over localhost. So if we go to, and you know what, we'll connect to it over uh, IPv4 localhost just for fun. So we'll get this, it's a blank page. Uh, but you'll see here that it finds my uh, LAN IPv4 and it finds my LAN IPv6 address. Uh, by itself, there's probably not a whole lot you can do with it because you're still going to be uh, browser sandboxed. Um, and especially if you're loading from across a network, accessing something on the LAN uh, may or may not be highly restricted. Uh, but it's definitely information you could use uh, as part of an exploit chain. And so it's definitely something uh, worth looking at. And that's pretty much it. Cool. All right. Any other sacrifices? Sacrifices. That's all we got. Going once, or launch, them twice. All right. I'll show them today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Excellent.